All right, folks, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of prime numbers is kind of a very important result and a very old result. This comes from around, let's say, 300 BC. Um, a mathematician named Euclid proved that there are infinitely many prime numbers. This result is millennia old. And it's something that people kind of intuitively think is true, but they haven't seen why it's true. So let me show you a way to prove this. And again, it's by contradiction. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume the opposite. So assume that there are finitely many prime numbers. And in fact, let's put them all into a set. So let's call these P1 all the way to PK. And let's let P equal that set of prime numbers. P1 all the way to PK. K could be ridiculously huge, but definitely finite. So we're assuming, and this is where the contradiction is going to be, we're assuming that there's a finite number of prime numbers, and here are all of them. That's the other key. This is all of them. There are no more prime numbers. If there were, then they would have been in this set. So let's make that note, actually. So this is all prime numbers numbers. That's all of them. We have them all. That's what we're assuming. Okay, so let's consider this. Let's consider this number n, which is the following. It is, take all of our primes in our set p, multiply them together, and then add 1. So if we think about that, well, this is kind of a special number. So note, for any prime p in p, well, for any prime, this first term here, this guy here, that's made up of all the primes multiplied together. So that bit is definitely divisible by any of the primes we multiply together. Of course it is. We multiplied all those primes together. So the quotient remainder theorem tells us that the remainder is always 1. So that's what we're thinking. So let's go ahead and finish this for any prime p. Uh, how do I want to write this? Let's use um, mod notation. So, so n is equivalent to 1 mod p. It has a remainder of 1 when you divide n by p. Because remember, those equivalence classes give you the remainders. So that's pretty cool. So what does that mean? So if you're not in the equivalence class of 0, that means p is not a factor of n. It has a remainder. That remainder is always 1. So what does that mean? Well, it must mean, thus, n, let's say, thus, n is either prime or a product of primes not in P, and that's by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. We know any number n is a product of primes. So that's really cool. But let's think about what that says. So 
if n is a prime number or a product of primes dot and p, well, that means that we missed some primes in set p here. So that means that p is not the set of all primes. But we said at the start that it was. We had all the primes. That was our assumption. We took all the primes that we had, we multiplied them together, and we got a new prime. So we missed that prime. So there's our contradiction. So this is a contradiction. And thus, uh, set P, let me make that a little bit bigger, actually, it looks like a lowercase p, set p must be infinite. And there we go. Thus, there are infinitely many primes. So there we go. It's a nice, easy proof once you think about it. But the whole idea is if you say you've got a mall, you never get the mall. Because this kind of number n up here, this always gives you new primes. Maybe n itself, maybe n's prime. Maybe it's a product of primes you don't have. I don't know. But my point is that it adds primes that you don't have. So you could say, well, just do it again. No problem. Put those primes in the P. But then this argument just works the same. Multiply all those, add one. Then you're going to get a prime number or a product of primes that aren't in your set P. So add them and keep going. That would happen infinitely often. So you'd build up infinitely many primes. So that's, that's um, why there are infinitely many primes. It's a very famous and very important result.